Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Check out this clip I came across between Michael Knowles and Chris Langan. Michael Knowles is interviewing Chris Langan. And Chris Langan is a very interesting fellow because he has tested an IQ test as the highest IQ uh, in the entire world, testing somewhere between 190 and 210, which is higher than Einstein. So, I mean, this guy, has, if all claims are correct, has tested really off the charts. And um, he's not what you would normally think of as a super smart guy just by looking at him. He's not some professor or, or, or what have you. Uh, he looks really like an average guy. So the conversation is very interesting where it goes. But in this clip, they talk about the idea of God. Is there a God and is there a way to sort of prove God from a, an intellectual standpoint? Take a look at what he says uh, in, his, in his viewpoint about God. From the perspective simultaneously, I suppose, both of depth and breadth here. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about a theory of everything, the first question we have to establish, does God exist? Yes. Simple as yes. that. Yeah. Well, it's the identity has a, uh, the reality has an identity. Okay? The identity is that as which something exists. Okay? Now, matter of fact, when you say the word reality, you're naming an identity. It is, you're identifying something. This. I'm, okay. I'm smiling because your, your answer on this is so beautiful. It, it just reminds me of, of Moses at the burning bush. And Moses at the burning bush says, who shall I tell the people that you are talking to God? And God says, tell them I am that I am. That's right. I am identity itself. I'm that's being exactly, that's himself. Exactly, that's exactly right. That, that, is a, that is a good uh, way of looking at it. Ehiyah asher ehiyah, meaning I will be that which will I will be. I am what I am. Uh, I am there. I am actual existence. I am reality. And that is sort of the way that he's describing the idea of God. Continue. That's what the CTMU says. It just comes up with the mathematical structure that you need to build a reality out of that. You see? So you come up with that identity and then you search it for its properties. You see, you, once you've built the preliminary framework, then you start deducing the properties of this identity and you find out that those properties match those of God as described in most of the world's major religions. Right? Just the theistic religions? I'm thinking Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, or, or are you talking also of, say... Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, Vedism. Of course, Hinduism and Vedism, they have a God. Uh, Taoism, you know, they, they, uh, their central principle is the way, or the Tao, yep. okay? And uh, they don't see Tao as, as, uh, as God. Yep. And then in Buddhism, of course, you've got, you know, they, they are trying basically to achieve sunyata or emptiness, right? Which is most Buddhists, a lot of Buddhists don't even understand what that's supposed to mean. Mm -hmm. But once again, there's no God there. You can kind of read God implicitly. Some Buddhists, I've talked to Buddhists, who actually think that there is a God in Buddhism mm -hmm. of a sort. But it's, you know, that concept of, of pure consciousness is what it is, okay? And if you ask them, well, whose consciousness are you talking about? they will point at themselves and say, mm. my consciousness. In a way, they're, you know, they kind of attribute the existence of everything to themselves. Mm. Okay? No, no, I know I've known not. a lot of people in Hollywood and Washington, D.C. who do the same thing, actually. Yeah. Well, that's, that's right. And that's why Buddhism is very fashionable among some of those people. <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> so, so, yes. Uh, but anyway, when you look at what they've, they've all got, you come down to the same thing. All right? You... you there, everybody has the Tao, or the way, you know, that's the way reality works, right? And, uh, and, and everybody, you know, has sunyata, which is pure syntax, right? Pure cognition with no instantiation, hmm. no content, right? And then you've got what, what the Abrahamic religions call God. It's all the same thing, okay? But what are its properties? Okay, are its properties such that you can deny the existence of God, or are its properties such that God definitely has to exist? And the answer is, God exists. God the properties, definitely the has properties to Properties of the central substance and central principle of reality, those properties are attributed to God, including, of course, you know, things like you have the three O's, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, but then you've also got consciousness. God has to be sentient. Hmm. So, so we're not just... We're not just defining God out of existence. Sometimes you'll hear people uh, say God exists, and, and, but they'll give God such a, a weak and shallow definition that the God that they're describing has no 
uh, no relation to the God that we conceive of. You're saying, no, this God is, God, God himself is conscious and, and therefore personal? Yes. You can establish a personal relationship with God. We're images of God. You know what an image is? It's basically the product of a mapping. God maps himself into each human being, right? That's a very personal thing that God is doing for us, yeah. right? And I don't understand how anybody can say that it's any different. We reflect the structure of the universe. Each one of us, we're carried by it. Everything we do, we exist in a medium. What is that medium? Right? Where did it come from? Yeah. What holds it together? What is the unifying coherence, the source of coherence of that medium? Now, now is, your claim that, is your claim a pantheistic claim that God is the universe or the universe is God and that's that? Mm. Or no? Or is God outside of the universe and created? Say, God is greater than, well, what is the universe? Damned if I know. You ever hear of the simulation hypothesis? Yes. Okay, well, the simulation hypothesis is basically the idea that the reality we see around us, physical reality, is simulated on some sort of a, an automaton or, or, a, or a computer. Yeah, some, some aliens somewhere have just, uh, they've fooled us. Right, right, exactly. I'm going to eat a piece of licorice. <laughs> but before one launches into the simulation, one needs a little sustenance, you know. Okay, so anyway... The idea is that you've got some kind of an automaton running. You've got a simulation running on it. And God, it's more panentheistic. Do you know what panentheism is? I do. Uh, I think I do. But uh, d that means that uh, we are in God. In, um, let, let me know how I've gone wrong. We are in God, and God is in us. And it is not merely that God and the creation are one and the same, but they are quite related. Is that something approaching panentheism? A little bit, yes. Okay. There's a, there's, the idea is that you've got the physical universe that you see around you, but God is not confined to the physical universe. Okay. See, there's a, 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 an ordinary pantheist thinks, assumes that God is somehow confined to the universe, that there is just what we see around us, and God is in every piece of it. God is distributed over it. Yeah. Right? But it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex than that. Because this part of the universe that we see around us cannot exist just by itself. Yeah. Okay? There are certain things that it entails. And when you go into those entailments, that's how you get to God. That's how you get to the identity of reality. Hmm. Okay? And now to get back to the, to the reality of self-simulation, or at least that's what I call it, self-simulation. But to get back to the simulation hypothesis, that we're living in the display of that simulation. In addition to the display, there is also a processing aspect, okay? And God it captures both of those things. He captures both the display and the processor. What, what do you mean? I, I hate to put it in the end. Well, I mean, okay, here's the display. You realize the display contains states. Yep. Okay, you see things, the objects contain states. States are static. Yep. That's why they're called states. Yeah. <laughs> okay, static. How do they change? Well, they have to be processed. Something has to okay. process. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in the calculus, for example, those are tiny little infinitesimal intervals, okay? But they are not actually contained in the states themselves. They have a neighborhood, a little tangent space or, or what have you, you know, where you can sort of draw little vectors that suggest that some kind of processing is going on. But the idea of being a state and being a process, those are two different things yep. to the, in the ordinary, ordinary way of looking at it, okay? It turns out that you can't properly describe reality and causation at all unless you put those things together somehow. Hmm. And that's what it takes God to do. Okay? God provides the processing functionality for your state. You have an internal yeah. state, an external state. You're a material human being. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like to explain how that is changing through time you and maintaining its coherence through time, even as it changes, that's what you need God for. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. In so there's, there's a lot to unpack, a lot of deep concepts that are being related, some of which um, overlap into Hasidic or Kabbalistic thought. But one interesting idea that I think is important to bring out, especially when he was talking about certain similarities with the concept of God amongst world religions, is this idea that is brought in Jewish tradition that originally everyone and everything comes from a single source, meaning from 
from Adam, the very first human being described in the Torah. And the way that our tradition lays it out is that Adam had this personal relationship with God, Adam and Eve, and, um, and they had children, they had children's children, and so forth. And by their grandchild's generation, they already started deviating, their grandchildren already started deviating their concept of God. And so uh, the grandchildren would say, oh, well, we would believe in God, but it, being a farmer, if I want to uh, ask God for my crops to grow and ask that the sun should shine on my crops, I don't need to bother the CEO, God. I have the sun itself, and I can just go to the minister that got appointed, the manager, if you will, that got appointed over heat and light to the world, and that's the sun. So I'll just ask the sun directly. And eventually that devolved into idolatry, and, and God was eventually dropped from the picture. But Abraham sort of reinstates the concept of monotheism, and uh, we're in the story of Abraham, we're, ta we're told something very interesting. Number one, that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations. And we see uh, very clearly that the, the God of the Bible is, some, is someone that is expressed in an obvious way uh, through not only Judaism, but later on through Christianity and Islam, the Western civilization has a, a, has a view of God that is uh, along the lines of what Abraham had developed, uh, these are the, these are the this is the ideology that has directly and indirectly come from Abraham. But there's also a very interesting idea that is brought out that is discussed in our tradition based on what it says at the beginning of Genesis chapter 25, where after the death of Sarah, Abraham marries once more, has uh, further children. And it talks about him giving these children gifts of his and then sending them to the east, sending them to the lands that are in the east. And our tradition is full of different commentaries that say that these gifts that were given weren't physical gifts, but instead were spiritual gifts, uh, spiritual wisdom that was utilized in, in the East. And it's interesting that the timing in which this would have come, come out 4,000 years ago, it bears a, it bears a striking resemblance to when some of the Eastern philosophies were also started. Chinese history begins around the same time as as. Uh, Abraham would have been sending his children, for example. And that's one of the reasons uh, that in our tradition, you would you would think that that a lot of the concepts of God, of spirituality, uh, have an overlap with things in Western civilization or things ultimately rooted in Judaism. Uh, in my book, Pillars of Faith, I actually go through a whole series of things in, in Hinduism that, that share a, a common theme and link uh, with the with Jewish tradition, with Jewish spirituality, and where how they find themselves in Hindu tradition, and sort of where that overlap might be, and so this concept of of a uh, universal, omnipresent, omnipotent uh, God and this force of oneness in creation is something that uh, Chris Langan not only mentions in reference to world religion and philosophy, but it's also interesting that from a scientific vantage point, we're also coming to the idea of the oneness in creation and how uh, even, the, even the concept of, uh, even the hypothesis of, uh, of the universe being something that is sort of a projection uh, is something that is discussed in Jewish texts as well. A lot of times when people think about the concept of God, they think of they envision an old man in the sky, sort of a juvenile look at God. But the way in which God is discussed, particularly in Jewish spirituality and our spiritual texts, is, is, is much more, I don't say sophisticated, but much more uh, enlightening and, and, and pure and interesting than the way described in this very juvenile sense. And so I, I do uh, appreciate this clip on multiple levels. I think it's very interesting, something to consider. And I look forward to continuing the conversation in the near future. If you enjoy this type of content, uh, I highly suggest that you hit that subscribe button over there in the corner, and we'd love to stay in touch with all of you. Have a wonderful day, everybody.